Yafet Kodo, a man whose name you also know, as you recognize immediately. He starred in such films as Alien, Alien Live and Let Die, uh, Brubaker on television. He played Last Days of Intibi, where he played Idi Amin. Now he's starring in another NBC series, which is called For Love, Love and, and Honor. Honor. Okay, because we had some <laughs> name changes at the last minute there. <laughs> That's television. Good to see you again. Good seeing you again. This is your first television series. Yes. I mean, on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah. So many have you done so far? I a television. I mean, yes, I mean, in this uh, in this series. Uh, we've done the pilot. Yeah. That's all. Which in these days sometimes means six shows, five shows. This is just one show. I think that if we if the the a the the word goes down that we're on, and it seems like that's happening, uh, there will be sixteen for the first year and 22 for the second and on down to five years. A successful film actor to make the jump to television, was it hard for you to do? I mean, did you have to think about it before you did it? No, because the decision was based on the material. You know, people say that, how can you go from movies to television? But you're really not going from movie to television, you're going from one script to the best script that you can find. And I, um, television scripts for movies and pilots, television had come to me before, but I was interested in the, in, in the subject matter. This subject matter, I was very much inter interested in. So it doesn't matter to me where they show it, as long as I play the character. Well, what's the show about? Uh, pa troopers in basic training. And you play which character? A sergeant named Sergeant uh, China, James Bell. A instructor? Eric? A drill instructor, yeah. yeah. Anything, I guess, people immediately ask you, is it anything like the Lou Gossett role in Officer and Gentleman? No, I don't think so. I think the opportunity to play this kind of role uh, might have been inspired by the Officer and Gentleman movie uh, um, that gave birth to it, but the role is completely different. Are you a tough guy? Well, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> On certain occasions. It depends when you need to be tough. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> isn't there a female lead in this? Isn't there a girl that wants to be a paratrooper also? Do I have that right? There are two women uh, in the show who are paratroopers and uh, who are going through basic training. This show is an ensemble of people, their problems uh, in it, women, men, you know. Which actually happens in the military now. Everybody trains amazing? together, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I was in, it was the, the big deal when you saw the wax. You know, once in a while, at a distance. You know, <laughs> now they all march together. During the break, you were talking to Dr. Friedman about some of your uh, your phobias. Yes, the fear of the the fear of flying. Well, you know? What are you going to do with the first time when they push you out of an airplane? Because after yeah. all, if you're going to be working with paratroopers, <laughs> I guess you're going to have to try it. It wasn't a problem. I don't know over the years now. I've I've been flying and flying and flying, and then suddenly in the last two years, I said, "Wait a minute, hold it! This first class business." Because before I was insisted, if I don't first fly first class, I'm not going. But all the first all the years, last couple of years. I says, wait a minute, I'm in first class. Yeah, the first one into the mountain, right? Right. So, oh, yeah. I, right. Sorry about that, yeah. So now I say, to the back of the airplane. So now, no one has to tell me to go to the back of the I go to the back of the plane. <laughs> back of smoking. That is a law. You know, a lot of people, that's a very common problem. You were saying that, Bill. And, and it's yeah. a problem that I had several years ago. As a matter of fact, I was a correspondent for, a, I was given, offered a job as a correspondent for uh, ABC Network News. And I realized I had to deal with the fear of flying. And there are a lot of very fine methods that you can use that can be very, very helpful. I need for all you. the methods. Okay. Right now, I'm sitting under, the, you know, where they say the, the box is and it's blast seat. And uh -huh. That's where I sit, because the statistics say that that part of the plane is built structurally fine. You don't have to worry about it. Even if it goes down, you can walk away. And at the end of some of the airline tragedies we see, we see, I was sitting in the back of the plane, and the guy gets off and says, I was asleep, you know, uh -huh. in uh -huh. the back. So that's why I sit. In that's the back what of the I plane. do, is I sleep. I get to fly a lot, and I sleep. Uh -huh. I just, that's I, I always take the red eye somewhere, mm -hmm. and then this way, if it goes, you know, I'll just either wake up down there or not know about it. You want a quick tip that, that works? Something oh, yeah. really very simple. Mm -hmm. it, this isn't the cure or the answer, but it's something that will help. And it's going to sound very simplistic, but just stick your head into the cockpit and say to the two guys that they listen, I'm going to be in 25C. You guys run into any trouble? You call me. I mean, do not hesitate. Let me really? know immediately. I'm precious cargo. I'm going to help you get this. Is that why? Oh, yeah. You're going to feel that sense of human contact. Mm -hmm. And then you say to the stewards, you know, I'm not flirting. I'm just, or the steward. I just want to tell you that I'm if there's any problem, well, or if you are, <laughs> be my guest, if there's a problem, I just want you to know because it so happens that I'm a professional healer and I'm going to calm the people in the plane and work with you. Uh, that gives you the sense that you're going to be in on the info just a little uh -huh. bit. 
and I think that it, it makes you feel there's not a robot up there. There right. are human beings who know that there are human beings who are concerned. And try it. If it doesn't work, don't call me. <laughs> I flew, this is true, I flew to Dallas one time, and across the, the aisle was uh, Ernest Ainsley, the healer. And all through the flight, I kept looking over at him, because I figured if anything was going to happen, maybe he'd know about it, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, once I was on a plane where the, the flight crew panicked, oh, it scared nice. me to death. They panicked. Uh, they panicked because they're supposed to be trained to just, you know, take anything, smile, we're going down or whatever. But there was a sudden panic, and they ran from the front of the plane towards the back, and I didn't know what was going on. See, at that point, scared to death. At that point, I'm dead. See, that's yeah. all I have to see. Is the you know, frankly, well, that's I hate the conversations the when I'm going to fly tomorrow. I don't oh, need to. I'm doing things to each other. Are you flying tomorrow? Uh, yes, I am. I'll hold your hand. That's okay. Right. Okay. The plane's going to the opposite Well, it doesn't matter. Well, they panicked because somebody had, uh, a lady had gotten sick and passed out in the back of the plane. Uh -huh. And they had uh, had to run back with the oxygen. Inexcusable. I they should have been fired dead. or dropped out of the plane at that very moment. Well, I wouldn't have tolerated it. Scary, scary. Of the plane. Well, listen, they have to have their punishment. Your other fear, which kind of ties in with the fear of flying, is the fear of dying. Not really. It's just the, the fear <laughs> of flying. It's, I think uh, I think that uh, that bothers me the most. And, and panicking, it's... Maybe I'm tired. Maybe I'm working too hard. Maybe I, don't, I don't think that's it. I think that very creative people who are in the peak of their life and oftentimes who are feeling that things are so wonderful have a tremendous fear of the loss of control that somehow... That's exactly it. Because things are happening for me now. And, you know, I'm going from one film to another, literally. I have a film coming out in August I'm very proud of. And um, I'm going to do a movie of the week in a couple of weeks. So things are What's happening. What's film in August? Star <coughs> Chamber. 20th Century Fox release. Okay. And I'm very proud of it. I'm hearing very good things about it. Things are going good. And um, because I guess because things are going good, yeah. now... It's your it, Jewish guilt. Right. Yeah. Now a little... <laughs> if a little thing happens in my chest, right away it's... Right away it's... The palpitation, it's it. It's this right. is it, it's terminal, whatever it's it is. It's terminal. Yeah. And I'm calling doctors and saying, listen, I felt a little something. Oh, a little I should something. give you my number. You can yeah. just call me from I anywhere, I'll tell you What do you fine. do as, as a psychologist? I mean, What do you mean what I do? I'm doing no, no, it. No, I mean, I mean <laughs> when you, you must have some things that bother you or worry you. Do you have to sit down and sort them out yourself? No, no, no. I would not be that arrogant. I have a guy that I, I credit with having saved my psyche. That I even see now... Uh, Several times, you, you know, I do talk radio as a psychologist in Detroit. I think I have a responsibility to see someone on occasion to make sure that I am well-grounded and I'm not flying somewhere or making people crazy. And I practice what I preach. So that's how you yeah, take care of it. Yeah, I don't attempt to be my own doctor. I, mm. I, I think that's a foolish thing to do. I always wondered about that, you know, especially when you sit around and listen to other people's problems all day long. Mm. There is the temptation on occasion, yeah. I will admit, to say, you think you got problems? Just <laughs> wait a minute. But you don't. I mean, you pass on it. Now, you're talking about all these films you've got out, the TV show, the, the films you've been working on. What is a normal schedule for you every day? How do you have time to worry about anything? You can find time. <laughs> you have to look for time to worry. That's right. I'm constantly worrying, and I don't like it. I, just, I don't know what to do about it. I thought I'd maybe go under hypnosis, and perhaps they could tell me, you know, that something is wrong, because constantly worrying about things, that it's not going to go right, and uh, if someone doesn't call me, and it's, 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 I said, well, maybe he's dead or something. And I was, oh, oh, oh my God, I see what worry the worrying is doing. Water over. I'm not water. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't get out of it. I don't know what to do. <laughs> you have that bracelet on. We were told that's a, a personal meaning to you. The, the, the this bracelet... Connected to a lot of things besides your arm. Right. This bracelet uh, comes from Self-Realization Fellowship. Um, I belong to that organization. I don't think you know... Uh, do no, you know who they no, are? No, no, that, They were started by an Indian yogi in 1929 by the name of Paramahansa Yogananda. He wrote a book called The Autobiography of a Yogi, which is self-explanatory in itself about where he's coming from. And for the last 10 years, I've been trying to follow their creeds and their thing about uh, meditation. Dennis Weaver is one of the, another well, member he was, of... Uh, he was on with us. Yeah. Yeah. Now, don't you have a ranch somewhere that you're turning into a project for this? How did you know this? Well, we got all these people out there that research and follow you around. Little short people. Oh, my God. No, I have uh, a couple of hundred acres in Spokane. I live in Tuc Tacoma. But no, that's not for this. That's for private. Oh, uh, that's a different thing. Yes. It's, private. it's just your own private ranch. Yes, my own thing. 
Mm-hmm. So that's where you go to relax. I haven't gone there yet to relax. You don't have any. I have any time to go there. I don't. Even, I haven't even seen the place. I was just going to say. I bet you haven't even seen it. I, yeah. Right? How do you know? I don't know. I'm, I'm just hanging out with you. Know <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> touch. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have a couple, a couple hundred acres that, uh, but I haven't seen it. What do you plan on doing with it? I don't know. <laughs> no, it idea. sounds good. You know. <laughs> it does. It right. sounds wonderful. I mean, whatever he says, it really sounds good. Well, I was doing Brew Baker. I said to uh, Robert Refford, we were living together practically for six months on that film. I said, what do you do then? You talk. He says, I have 7,000 acres. I said, oh, that's great. I said, that's it. Impressive. That's it. That's it. I said, sure. So I'm working on the first 200, and I've got 8,000, get 1,000 more than he, and then I'll call him up to see my play. Yeah, I have two minks. I'm working on a whole really? coat, but I just <laughs> put together. I figure at some point I'll be a winner. i got a one-bedroom <laughs> apartment. That's about it for me. Well, we're going to take a little break, and we're going to come back. I hope everybody can stay with us. And uh, we'll be back with Don Messick, who is Papa Smurf. Stay with us.